Hello, and welcome to the Lyrical Lounge, our poetry show here at KBVR-TV. My name is Phoebe, and I'll be your host for this evening. I'm a second year digital communication arts student here at OSU, and I'm excited to talk poetry with you and introduce you to a wonderful poet. Our goal for the Lyrical Lounge is to be a space where local poets of all styles and experience levels can showcase their work and get their pieces out into the world. We're excited to welcome a lovely poet who's prepared to share some of her original work on the show tonight. We'll now welcome our guest poet, Alina Kroll, to the stage. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Alina and I'm a fourth year English and creative writing major. I'm president of the Student Literary Club, a member of the Creative Writing Society and a volunteer at PRISM. Today, I'm going to be reading four of my poems for you. The first one is called My Baby, and it's about a woman who experiences a miscarriage. I never pictured it ending like this, with you laying in a hole dug with my own hands at the park because it was the only nice place I could think of, and how it ended with me up above, all breathing and alive and well in body, but never in mind, and you down there, choking in dirt as your bones rot into soil. And for that, I am sorry. You see, I didn't think it would happen like this. Even if everyone said there wasn't any hope for me, wearing shoes that didn't even lace up, they were so worn, and eating bread for most dinners, and how I couldn't figure out how to stay okay long enough to get a job and a decent meal. So we sometimes went for days walking, just trying to fill scraps to fill the bag that I held so we could be all right. Except, it wasn't all bad like some people think. We had a nice apartment, passed down from my father, and we had my favorite dress, blue with songbirds chirping a pattern. And sometimes I sang, and you danced around in my belly, like you were real happy in there. And I didn't try to make you, so don't go around thinking it was intentional. But maybe I should have tried harder, and then maybe you wouldn't have existed, and you wouldn't have hurt so bad. And I wouldn't have a once there, now gone pit inside of me, that I can't ever have filled again. So, no, I don't think it's right when people cross their brows at me and preach a poem of you should have been better because I was doing the damn best I could. And don't get this wrong, even though I didn't try to make you, I never once not wanted you. And now you're sleeping down there and I can't reach you anymore. And I will not ever be there to rub my hands along your tiny back and comfort you. And for that, I am the most sorry that anyone could be. The best feeling was your slippery head and my cupped hands of blood and your lumpy purple legs. Too skinny, already no good for walking or thinking or living. You had your barely formed fingers wrapped around my whole heart, just squeezing, just holding. You held me. The second poem is called, When a Morning Dove Calls, You Answer. And the first line is taken from Ross Gay's poem, Burial. You're right, you're right. What's certain now will certainly not be so in the future. The delicate touch of a lover's hands fading into only a memory of their nails scratching, oh, so gently across my open back. And I bet that someone could tell me why it is. I forget so much but remember exactly where you placed your pinky finger when you kissed me for the hundredth time. Tell me, what is it like to be grasped so gently throughout the night, to wake each morning because a cooing dove tells you it is the right time to do so, and to follow that joyous bird's instructions without a moment's hesitation, then turn over in that same warm bed and plant a kiss on the forehead of somebody whose laugh sometimes erupts from their chest with such force that you think they might just come apart right then and there. But now is not one of those moments, for it is a gentle, quiet time, and you kiss him once more, even if you know, but of course will never admit, that maybe he isn't who you first thought him to be, because he doesn't cook you dinner and set the table with candles and cloth, and perhaps he doesn't even own a candle. But maybe there's something else beyond that imaginary version of him and if that person is not perfect, perhaps you do not care because at least they are real. 
in the end, my crossed hands will rest on my covered chest, and I will remember maybe only one or two moments of the life that came before me. My goodness, I hope my memories are of you. This poem is called Invading a Host. It was written for a class in which we had a prompt to take a word and personify it. I chose the word lysome, which means agile and graceful, and I personified it as a sort of snake-like creature. The lysome slithers over sleek tile floors, allowing its form to flatten, to sneak under doors. It hides in the smallest of cracks, drawing back at each tiny noise, each vibration. It feels so much. The shell of an untouched supply cart becomes its playground. Dust clings to the creature's slippery body, and each particle disappears as the lysome absorbs. It is always searching. With each mode of dust, its body becomes a fraction bigger. It is thin, yet large. It can flatten to span a hallway, darkening tile floors with ripples of movement. It can shrink into the palm of your hand, but only if you let it. It waits, holds its movement until the nurses have left and it can make its entrance. The lysome slides across vast distances in the blink of your eye. In one second, it reaches the front desk, and the next is traveling through air ducts. Soon, it has arrived. The lysome hisses with pleasure, a frightening sound from a creature who boasts neither lungs nor mouth. Today, its excitement arises from finding a perfect host, a young boy. It always chooses the children. So supple is their flesh. So eager are their hands to reach out and touch the unknown. If he knew a thing about the lysome, the boy would have never allowed the creature to curl in his hand, to caress his heart with gentle movements, and saturate him with awe. The boy's ignorance is overshadowed by his curiosity. It is not long before the process is complete. The lysome expands, allowing its body to cover the boy's. The creature sinks in with a murmur, a gentle whisper of content satisfaction. It spends a few minutes adjusting, feeling out its existence in a new, larger self. Then it escapes, trailing the hallways a few feet longer. For the final poem, I will read one that was um, written on my dad's birthday last year. I saw a skunk on the road that had been run over. The title is Roadkill, August 2023. How quickly does red blood fade into a smear of tan on black? How soon does the sharp musk, the bitter scent of glands burst, fade into clean air? The pungent stink of wretched death dissolves as her carcass disappears from view. How soon she's forgotten the pearly snarl of her teeth, the grimace of her mouth, open halfway in despair, halfway in anger, and the bristles of her black and white tail. Her bones are crushed again and again, her organs pop sway onto pavement, her flesh, her fur, everything fades to a mere smear of color on asphalt. It is up to me to remember. Remember her colors, her life, her teeth da ground down by countless tires over road. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful pieces, Alina. Now, before we head to a quick, quick break, we have a very special guest for you tonight. Us here at the Lyrical Lounge went and visited one of our poets, Jay, from our first episode. Go watch that episode and check out their work. Uh, on our visit, they gave us a sneak peek into their writing space and offered some great advice for getting into the headspace to write. I'm now going to turn the time over to Jay to share that with us. Stay tuned, because when we come back, we are going to hear a bit more from Alina about herself and her poems. Hi 
folks, I'm Jay Anghauser. You may remember me from the previous episode of Lyrical Lounge, where I was invited to read a poem from my collection, Words from Parents and Fruit Baskets, which earned an honorable mention for the Weaver Undergraduate Poetry Award last year. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a fifth year senior creative writing major and the editor in chief of PRISM. As you can all see, this is my office. I just moved from a tiny one bedroom apartment, so I'm super lucky to now have a dedicated space to write that isn't combined with my living room and dining room. I do share it with my husband, who assembled most of the Legos featured in the video. I should also mention I tend to share it with my two children, fur children, my dog Kona and my kitten Pumpkin Pie. I know a lot of people, especially poets, who wait for the right mood or for the muse to strike before they sit down and write. It's amazing when this happens, but unless you're having these perfect moments a few times a week, not a lot of writing actually comes out of it. So if you're wanting to get more writing done, I would recommend setting up a space you're really comfortable in, setting time aside in your schedule to just write, and doing something that will make your brain think, okay, it's time to write. All right, we go live in five, four, Ready, camera two. And wipe it. Welcome to KBVR TV. Come join our team. Audio, man, it's it's in the air. It's the fluctuations that uh, vibrate our ear holes and make the cochlea sensitive. You know, um, I just you can't ignore it. And you try to start measuring it, and it just pulls you in. Well, I used to try to play music on my own, make the sounds from my own hands and instruments. And then I started recording. Upon hearing myself in my recordings, I decided I should just record. When you're a young adult who is serious about pursuing media as a career, or even a side hustle, a lot of people won't take you seriously. OMN is cool because not only will they take you seriously, they'll push you and they'll give you all the tools to really try to do something special with it and let you be creative about it. And so that's what's been special about OMN to me. I'm Sam Lay and I'm a student engineer at Orange Media Network. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm sitting here with Alina Kroll. We're so excited to have you on the show tonight. Thank you so much for coming out and sharing your work. Uh, we wanted to get, a, get to know you a bit more and get some insight on the poems that you shared with us tonight. Um, my first question that I have for you is, what was your inspiration for your poem, The Morning Dove? Um, this was a poem that I read Sorry, I wrote for a class this term, and my professor, um, Jennifer Richter, asked us to read a poem from Ross Gay called Burial, and then to take the first line, which is, you're right, you're right, and combine that with 10 or so of our favorite words. And I, I didn't exactly know what my favorite words were, so 
I made a list of words I liked instead. Um, and half of them were kind of more violent, not because I really like violence, but because I think it can produce an interesting effect in written works. And Absolutely. then the other half were kind of more gentle and loving. So I decided to go with that. And I don't know, have you read Broske or, or watched him perform? A little bit, yeah, I watched him perform. Um, and I just loved his sense of voice. And mm -hmm. he went into a little bit of like stream of consciousness um, in his recitation that was just so engaging. Oh my gosh, I loved it. Yeah, I really like that as well. So I kind of tried to incorporate some of that, at least with the emotion he puts into his words and somewhat of the line length as well. And that was what, and then I came up with this poem. So I'm pretty happy with it. Yes, absolutely. I think definitely that transferred over uh, into that piece. Uh, do you have a certain routine or process to help you get into the mindset to write? Well, sometimes, especially if I have an assignment, it's kind of easy for me to get into that mindset because I'll be mm -hmm. going to class and reading poetry and thinking about it a lot. And so I'm kind of just surrounded by it and it comes more naturally. But if I'm not taking a poetry class, I like to write down whatever I'm thinking, kind of just a, a brainstorm. Mm -hmm. And usually that brings up some thoughts or emotions that I didn't really recognize on the surface level. And I'm always able to come up with something that could be interesting to write. Not, it doesn't always work, but it, most of the time is okay. And then I also keep a little journal just in my phone mm -hmm. of interesting words or phrases or events that I see. And sometimes I'll pull from that to create a new work. Right. So like if you're walking around campus or kind of just going throughout your daily life, mm -hmm. you'll just jot down some, some little kind of yeah. thoughts and images and things exactly. to use. Exactly. Today in one of my classes, a girl told us that where she used to live, people had a rumor of a five-legged dog that danced mm. on fences. And I thought that might be good in a poem. Oh, I love that. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, my next question for you. Um, is there anyone in your life that has helped you become the writer that you are today? Yeah, two of my professors, um, Professor Holmberg, who is in the audience, thank you, and Professor Richter, they've been great. I've taken um, two classes with Professor Holmberg and um, I believe three with Jennifer Richter. Mm -hmm. And I really, really like them. I get exposed to a lot of wonderful poetry and prose sometimes. And then we also do workshops, which has helped me a lot. And I've been to both of their office hours. They're very helpful. They're always willing to read my work and give me feedback on that. So I really appreciate them. Right. Yeah, I've heard the writing department is just mm -hmm. wonderful here at OSU. It so, is. Yeah, I'm so glad that they've been able to help you um, with that. Is there an element of poetry or poetry writing style that you typically avoid? Yeah, I do not like rhymes. I don't like reading them most of the time and I don't like writing them. So I was upset with the one poem I read. It had a rhyme in it, but I just couldn't <laughs> figure out how to not do that. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of the time when I read a poem with rhymes, it distracts me. It's mm. where all my attention goes to and then I'm not able to focus on the meaning, both right. surface level and deeper. And I also think it's really hard to do well because sometimes you need to rhyme at the end of the line and you can't find the right words, so you mm -hmm. kind of force something. But I will say that when it's done well, it can work nicely to create a good rhythm. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, do you have a poet or writer that you draw inspiration from? Yeah, I mentioned this before, but Roske. I really mm. like his poems and I'm not particularly well versed in poet, so he's kind of one of the only ones I know. Um, I, I really like the way he puts so much emotion in, and his performances are amazing. I have a hard time putting emotion into my words but it, when I speak, but mm -hmm. on the page, I think I can somewhat emulate what he does. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, yes. <laughs> um, what kind of impact has writing had on your life? Well, I would say that it's given a voice to things that would have otherwise remain silent in me mm -hmm. and it helps me process things even if it's something happy it's still nice to have a way to express that um, recently I wrote a poem for a class about this cat that I used to be friends with he lived in my neighborhood I go see him every day and then one day he disappeared and he that was two years ago but I, I still think about him so much and writing that poem helped me process the grief a little bit more yeah absolutely I think that poetry can be such a great channel for emotion, and we've definitely seen that in your pieces tonight. Um, 
Is there any advice that you have for aspiring poets who are just starting to write their own poetry? Yeah, definitely. Um, the first thing I would say is to read your poems out loud, and that's um, when, whatever stage you're writing in, whether you're brainstorming or it's your first draft or you think you're done. Because whenever I do that, I come across words that sound either really good or really bad, and I'm able to figure out why they're working or not working, and then how I can either fix it or implement a similar strategy throughout the rest of my poem. Mm -hmm. And it also, you were talking about this earlier, brings attention to the kind of, the, the sounds of the words, the lyrical right. quality of it. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's really important in poetry. And then my second suggestion is to have someone else read your work. And I know that can be scary because it's a very vulnerable thing, but if they're your friends, hopefully they'll be nice to you, they'll give you some suggestions. And I've found that when someone else reads my work, they're usually able to offer an interpretation I hadn't considered, and then mm -hmm. also suggestions for things I hadn't thought of. I noticed that in your recitation, you have a very specific way that you recite your poems. Is, did you come to kind of a, I don't know, a, a point of practice, I guess, with that? Or like, how, how was your process in finding the way that you wanted to recite those? Do you mean the accent? Oh, I mean, if you want to go into that, <laughs> but also just, yeah, the other parts of it as well. Yeah, well, I will say I've practiced these a lot. And um, sometimes when I write, something, I write it in a southern accent. When I'm, I'm thinking, I'll, I'll write it by speaking and then put it on the page. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, I think it works better. I like the voice it gives, and so that's the voice that I gave to the poems as I spoke them aloud, at least the first two. It also kind of helps me feel a little bit more comfortable to have an accent because it's like a little, I, I don't know, like a little prop you're holding on to. Yeah, <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, did that develop over time, or was it something that you kind of initially started doing with your pieces? I haven't always done it. It was mm. more recent. I think um, about a year ago, that's when I wrote my baby. I'd say that's the first time I've, mm. I've done that. Mm. I think that fits really well with that piece, so mm. it makes sense that it was kind of, what initially kind of brought you to doing that. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your responses. Oh, yes. um, that's all the time we have for our interview segment. Um, we're now going to cut to a short break. But keep watching, because after the break, we are going to dive into some more poetry. I joined Orange Bee Network as a freshman. I think it was my second week of being a freshman here. And I was looking for an opportunity to get involved in something on campus. And I had done a little bit of high school journalism, not a lot, but I came up here to the fourth floor. I saw the TV studios, I saw the radio booth. I saw all the computers and I thought, this is super cool. This is something I want to get involved in. And I joined the Barometer team as a freshman. I learned so many things that I would have never learned in a classroom. Not only did I learn how to do journalism, how to design a newspaper, how to produce a TV show, I learned skills on top of that that are definitely going to help me in whatever I go do with my life. These past four years, OMN has meant to me to be a place where I can come and be myself, where I can come and challenge myself, push myself, learn and grow. It's a place where you come up here and you think you know who you are, you think you know the type of leader that you are, the type of person that you are, but you'll look back as a graduating senior four years later and think, wow, I am not the same person as I was when I stepped on this floor the very first time as a freshman. My name is Lauren Sless. I am the producer of Spotlight at KDVR TV at Orange Media Network. Uh, is this thing even on? Hello everybody, this is DJ Trainwreck. The show is Derailed, the only show where a man blows a train whistle in your ears. Hi, this is DJ Rock Lobster and you're listening to Happy Hour. This is DJ Dolomite, and you're listening to the Subduction Zone. Tune in to hear more at kbvrfm.orangemedianetwork.com or live on the air at 88.7. Counter a single mean person. As much as you insist that you're mean, Jada. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I'm... Or Black History Month here 
of Oregon State. Looking the ball for there's not a great level. Yeah. Oh, it's not Ooh. eliminated. Oh, right. Really that one. Just to press your topping down a little bit, make sure they fit in you know, firmly on top of the sushi and they won't come out. Hello, and welcome back to the Lyrical Lounge. Before we went off for break, we were able to hear some great info on our guest poet and the poem she chose to read today. I would now like to share with you all a piece of poetry from Oregon's current poet laureate, Anis Mojgani. This piece is part of his book of poetry, The Tigers They Let Me, so please go check out Anis's other work if you enjoy this poem. To the Sea. Sometimes when you start to ramble, or rather when you feel you are starting to ramble, you will say, well, now I'm rambling, though I don't think you ever are. And if you ever are, I don't really care. And not just because I and everyone really at times falls into our own unspooling, which really I think is a beautiful softness of being human, trying to show someone else the color of all our threads, wanting another to know everything in us we are trying to show them. But in the specific, in the specific of you, here in this car that you are driving, and in which I am sitting beside you with regards to you, and your specific mouth parting to give way to the specific sweetness that is the water of your voice tumbling forth. Like I said, I don't ever really mind how much more you might keep speaking, as it simply means I get to hear you speak for longer. What was a stream, now a river. Well, folks, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much to Alina for coming on as our guest poet tonight. We couldn't have done this without you. And thank you all so much for tuning in to our second episode of the Lyrical Lounge. I've been your host, Phoebe Eisen. Until next time, thank you and good night. One thing I really love about my job is I get to work with a lot of different people and have a lot of fun with them. Oh man, the bullpen, it's honestly my second home. It's always like something's going on here, it's always music playing, but at the same time it's like that one big family feel here. So yeah, that's what the bullpen means to me. It's a place where we like to foster a lot of our community, where you get to know people really well, a place to hang out. What I like about Omen in general is just like, it's just like the community aspect. It's just such a fun place to work. I always like to say it's the best job on campus. It's like the one place like where like you could be like radio, work for a magazine publication. You can do everything and like it's kind of accepted and normalized. So yeah. It's just so much fun. I can't stress that enough. Why not work here? It's, it's a really cool place to be.